I'm joined today for the Haley Go quiz by Richard Goddard QC. Hello, Richard. Hi, Edith. How are you? I'm very well. How are you? Good. Fine. Good. We're surviving, yeah. Good stuff. Um, so thank you so much for agreeing to, to take the quiz. Um, I'm excited to hear your answers. Uh, to well, we'll wait till you hear them first then. You can make your mind up later. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's get started. So the first question, Richard, is if you weren't a lawyer, what would you be? Well, um, this is a bit of a difficult one for me to, 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 to think about because at school I had no idea what I wanted to be. I, I'm not one of these people who can come on and say that, um, that I'm, I'm doing a job that I wanted to do since I was a wee boy or whatever because I had no idea um, what I wanted to do. And I remember in uh, fifth year the school ran a work experience scheme and um, my week was, uh, in fact, spent in a, a vet in Edinburgh, um, where uh, I sent him just from memory, most of the week was cleaning out cats and dogs kennels, <laughs> running for sandwiches. And then the, uh, the high point of the week, as I remember, was uh, getting the privilege of watching uh, an enormous uh, Labrador uh, being uh, sterilised on the Friday afternoon. So uh, it wasn't really uh, for me after that, I realised, but it, I, I had really no idea, uh, even going into to sixth year, I think. Um, I, I, I planned to um, do English at university because I like English literature, and um, that was the, the original plan. But there was a late uh, change, and I went into law instead. Um, but had I done English, I have no idea where that was going to take me either. So... <laughs> Um, I've, I really no idea what I was going to be. Um, I knew I didn't want to sit in an office uh, mm -hmm. all day long, every day, um, day in, day out. And, you know, thankfully, I've, I've managed to achieve that, I think. Yeah. And so what, what changed your mind at the last minute then? How, what, why, how did it suddenly go from English literature or in English to law? Was there something well, that... Yeah, I mean, I I I got better grades than I'd expected to, to get. Oh, really? um, it opened up different uh, avenues and things. And uh, I, I, I decided to, to do law. Uh, one thing I would say is that when I went to university, I was, um, I was only 17 and I wasn't 18 until the, the following year. And I, I think uh, I was probably quite young to, 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 to be doing a, a, a degree like law at that time, because uh, in hindsight, I think I didn't really, I like university, but the subject matter, I think in first year, I found quite uh, not, not terribly engaging and that sort of thing. And it's, it's a degree I would maybe have enjoyed and understood a bit more had I been a wee bit older, possibly, but that's yeah. all with hindsight. I know. Well, you sound better like me. I did my work experience uh, at VETS as well, but I actually did want to be a VET, but uh -huh. I didn't get the grades for that. And I went to uni when I was 17, but I think I went, I went to Dundee for my first year and kind of struggled just looking after myself <laughs> so yeah, I yeah. coming well, home um, after right. nine months um, but yeah um, like you I probably would have appreciated it far more if I'd been a bit more mature I think so yeah yeah, yeah. oh well okay question number two uh, did you have a nickname at school and if so what was it and why were you given it well um the nickname that I was given at school uh, has stuck to this day actually and my nickname at school was Titch and so you, you don't need me probably to, to explain why I was given it, um, but it, it has still stuck today. Um, even I, I sometimes even get emails sent to me saying, dear Titch. And of course, you, you then think, how, how am I going to reply to this? You know, am, am, I, am I really at my age going to sign it off? So, um, but that, that was my nickname. And uh, the, uh, the, I, I was always sort of the smallest boy in the class sort of thing, for, even from, from P1 really. And... Um, the, the school I went to had a Founders Day ceremony, which took place every uh, sunny day in June. And it was quite a formal occasion. And uh, the whole school would uh, assemble in a, a, a quadrangle in the school. And each year was arranged in rows according to their height. And the boy, the smallest boy in the year was known as a marker because they marked the end of the, the aisle. And uh, I had the honour of being a marker for 13 consecutive years between <laughs> 1973 to 86. So I was always the weakest boy in the, in, in, in the school. Um, and I, I do remember also, um, we'll come on to, to, to talk about traineeships and things, but part of my training was with George Moore. And um, but by then, because of, of course, I'd gone to university at 17, I, I was going into the cells and things. I was maybe only about, uh, I forget now, maybe 22, 23 years old or something. And I remember on my first week there, one of the, the old criminals, 
that George acted for saying to me, I'm, I'm not being funny, but he said, but are you one of these like YTS lawyers or something? <laughs> the YTS was the youth training scheme that was in place at the time. So yeah, I was always uh, the, a, a sort of wee kind of young looking guy. Uh-huh. Oh, that's funny. Oh my yeah. goodness. <laughs> All right, question number three, Richard, is what was your first job? Well, um, the first jobs I, I did were really summer jobs um, outside of uh, a university. And the, um, the first year or two, I got this job every year with a, a, an insurance company in Edinburgh. And it was, it was really just, um, I think it was sort of made for me, really. Um, and it was doing sort of mainly delivering mail, to be honest around uh, the city centre in Edinburgh and there was no pressure at all and I could take as long as I liked and things and uh, meet up with pals uh, along George Street and things so um, that was the first um, one I, I did but after that um, I had summer jobs in uh, America. Um, I was a breakfast chef over there for a while and um, mm-hmm. the, then after that uh, a, a job on a ferry uh, that ran between um, New Jersey and Delaware mm-hmm. and I, I used to cook the burgers and serve the beers and all that sort of thing um, and it was a great job because it, uh, it started I think it's something like two o'clock in the afternoon and finished about maybe eight o'clock or nine o'clock at night and the the, the place I stayed in was a, a big house with um, loads of Irish uh, girls and guys and it was a very very it's a sociable time and of course these are great hours because you came off the ferry uh, straight up to meet up with everybody else and then you could lie in your bed or lie in the sun as much as until two yeah. o'clock the next day to start work again. So um, that was, those were the first jobs I had before I started a proper proper work and traineeship, etc. cetera. So wow. um, other works came as a bit of a shock to the system, I think. <laughs> After that, I'm sure it would. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Um, okay, uh, question four. What do you recall of your first court experience? Um, well, I, I did my my traineeship. I started at um, Morton Fraser Milligan, down called Morton Fraser, and um, I did court work in the, the first year I was there. And um, that court department, actually, uh, you think about it now, had um, uh, within it a, a trainee, a partner, and an assistant solicitor, all of whom are now high court judges. Um, so it was you know, quite a place then. Yeah. But um, I, I remember um, you'd be given the small claims court to do. And uh, the clerk of the small claims court at that time, believe it or not, was Richard Newlands, who uh, really? we, we know as the a clerk in, in the, the uh, high court now. Yeah. But you, you were sent up basically to the, to the small claims court. And uh, I didn't have really, to be honest, have much of a clue about civil procedure at that time. And uh, you were told, well, just move for decree or move to desist or something like that. And I would just scribble this down on at the back of a piece of paper <laughs> and stand up and just see these magic words and just hope for the best. And uh, if there was any sort of inquiry made beyond that, you were at sea a wee bit. But uh, those were the first uh, court appearances. But um, trial wise, the first trial I remember doing was in the district court in Edinburgh mm-hmm. um, when I was working at uh, George Moore's office and it was a trial for um, the very serious crime of not having a television license <laughs> and uh, so this case went to trial and I remember the result was not proven and right. looking back now you sort of think how how, how does that happen I mean you, you've either got one or you've not but uh, <laughs> the first trial um, but I've always thought that uh, throughout that, um, you know, your first, the first time you stand up to do a pleading diet, the first time you do a, a summary trial, your first jury trial, they're always uh, horrible experiences, to be honest. Mm-hmm. And you, you can't say that that was enjoyable at all. And you're terrified and you wonder how you ended up getting washed up on the shore doing these things. Don't you, <laughs> you sort of have this out of body experience? Absolutely. But, you just have to do it and then you do it again and it's not quite so bad. Then you do it again and it's even better. So it is, I think, I've always thought throughout uh, everything that I've, I've done, a case of just uh, getting your head down and getting it done and then uh, knowing that it's going to be easier the next time. And, it, and it, generally it has been, I think. Yeah, well, that's very true, Richard. I think um, the first of I mean, the first district court appearance, I can remember being absolutely terrified and just as terrified as I was maybe doing first jury or first high court trial. Yeah, um, absolutely. But we're here to, uh-huh. 
to tell the tale still. <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, question number five is, uh, who is or was your most inspiring colleague? Well, um, uh, by colleague, I suppose I've taken it as just in people that I've, I've worked alongside. Yeah. And um, I, I've, as you know, for the last few years, have, have uh, been in Crown Office, and which is something, you know, I, I would thoroughly recommend to, to, to anybody. And, um, you know, one of the great benefits of it, privileges really, is just having been around uh, and mixing with a, 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 a diverse bunch of people from all sorts of, of legal backgrounds, uh, people that I would never have had the opportunity to have met uh, had I not taken that that job, I know. Um, but your, your question is, who is the most inspiring person? And um, I think perhaps the most inspiring person that I've met in that job was or uh, was my friend Martin McCarry, um, who you'll remember, uh, Edith, yeah. of course, uh, yeah. was uh, an advocate deputy who sadly we lost about, I think, four years ago now. Yeah. And um, I don't think I've ever met a, a braver person in my life. And um, he was ill, as, as you know, for many, many months. And the way that he dealt with that was um, remarkable, I think, for everybody who knew him. Never uh, any a hint of self-pity, none of that, and always extremely positive. And um, one of the things I, I think that I always remember is that uh, he had to endure some really, really terrible treatment, very difficult treatment. And um, I think uh, it was at a time when I think he knew that he wasn't going to get better. And he said to me that despite all of that uh, treatment that he had undergone and uh, the difficulties he'd been through, that if he did get better, all of that would have been worth it. And it seemed a remarkable thing to say. And he said that the reason it would be worth it is because it made him uh, know now uh, how to spend time and what the valuable ways of spending time were. And he said that um, the top of his list was um, to spend time with, with family. Mm -hmm. So it gave him an, an appreciation of, of the value of time. And uh, that's quite an inspiring thing, I think. And um, it's something I suppose we can all uh, lose sight of in you know, the busy lives that we all, we all have. Um, but you know, leaving uh, that, uh, the other individuals, of course, within Crown Office um, are uh, Alex Prentice, Ian McSporin, um, these are people who you know I've shared rooms with for for years, and they're not only a great company um, and great lawyers, but they're also people who are very generous with their time. And you know, all of us have benefited from from being around uh, these people um, and and sharing uh, stories. And if you've got a problem, it's talked through, and uh, and you, you end up wondering, uh, you know, what, why didn't I didn't I see that myself? You know, um, uh, so these are these are inspiring people. Yeah. Uh... Absolutely, and and I think threaded through all of that is some humour as well, isn't there? Because oh, it, absolutely, Ab absolutely. I mean, it, it's uh, it, there, there are there there are moments uh, or many moments uh, in in Crown Office where uh, you, you know your 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 tears running down your face over certain <laughs> things at times, <laughs> um, but it's 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 been uh, it's been very good to, for for me, and I'm, I'm sure it'd be uh, I, I would recommend it to, to to anybody who was thinking of it. Oh, great. Okay. Um, question six, Richard, is how do you define success? Well, I suppose um, people looking in at lawyers would say, well, it's, it, it must be how much money you make and uh, who makes the most sort of thing. And, you know, we all are uh, working to make a living, aren't we, at the end of the day. But success, I think, uh, it can't be measured in the, the amount of money you earn at the end of the year. And instead, I, I think that uh, when you start out doing the job that we do, you see people um, who you come to uh, have real respect for and uh, really admire. And if you can get to a point where you, you've uh, managed to earn the respect of these people who you admire, then I, I would say that's success. All right. Good answer. Mm -hmm. um, Question seven is favourite holiday destination. Um, well, again, this got me thinking, Edith, um, back over the years, and um, I always remember as a wee boy, we used to um, get into the family car, which was a, a Morris 1100, which is not a big car, and I'm talking about the 1970s here, and um, me and my, my brother and my, my twin sister would all pile in the back, and my mum and dad in the front, 
my dad smoking his pipe all the way down to, to Devon. And um, maybe that's why I'm, I'm, I'm titch now. You, you never know. But uh, we, we went to this, this farm that we stayed on and uh, we would get up early in the morning and collect the eggs and uh, herd cows down for milking, this sort of thing. And looking back now, maybe with rose tinted glasses, these uh, seemed like sort of really idyllic holidays that to us we thought was almost on the other side of the world, you know, it taking so long to get there. Um, and I've, I've sometimes thought about going back and having a look at these places again, but maybe it's better right or left untouched, <laughs> I don't know. But um, cities, I mean, I, I love um, Rome. Um, New York's a fantastic city that, 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 that I really enjoyed. But um, right now, on a, you know, a, a, a grey day in uh, the third lockdown of what we're in, if I was to be somewhere that, that I've been before, I would say the Maldives. Um, we went there um, before children, and uh, it was, I think, a you know, great place. The weather's fantastic. Mm. The beaches are, are great, and I, I quite like um, diving. And the, the the diving there was just, you know, out of this world. It was, mm. uh, you know, turtles and sharks and uh, reefs and things. Like that. It was just uh, terrific. Um, I, I'd actually done a a, a course, um, I think, a, a few weeks before I'd gone, which was in the sea off Guruk. So um, to go to go over there to the Maldives was a slightly different experience. I bet it was. Yeah, there's yeah. a few wonderful things in the water at, uh, at and, and in Gurik, but um, they're not they're not uh, they're not uh, turtles or sharks. <laughs> no endangered species, I imagine. No, no. <laughs> Unrecognisable species. Uh, oh, you're making me feel um, very jealous for a holiday right now, Richard. But I'm yes, one of us. Yeah, we are. Um, oh, that sounds amazing. I've never been to the Maldives, but you've certainly sold it. <laughs> there. Yeah, oh, well, absolutely. absolutely. I think we'd pay a lot of money to be there right now, wouldn't we? Lockdown. Uh-huh. Definitely. All right. Um, question number eight is your most memorable case. Um, well, uh, again, you know, it's, it's hard to, to, to pin them down, but certainly one of the most uh, unusual ones that, that I remember doing was... Um, before I came into Crown Office, um, I defended uh, an accused, he's one of two accused actually in the High Court, who was uh, charged with the uh, antiquarian crime of uh, what's called violation of sepulchres, um, which is the crime that the body snatchers had been charged with in the early 19th century. And that's what these two young lads were charged with. And it had been the first prosecution of of this in, uh, I think, many, decades Mm -hmm. and uh, of course I had to go and try and read up on this and what what it involved and uh, what the penalties for it were and things and I remember uh, dusting down one book in the in the library and uh, it stated that ordinarily the the sentence uh, if you're found guilty ought to be imprisonment with hard labour but in aggravated cases or with previous convictions the, the prisoner should be sentenced to transportation which was, of course, the boats to the colonies. Yeah. So, so that's, that's how old this was. But the facts of that case, put briefly, were two teenagers who I think had probably a, a few litres of white lightning on board <laughs> in Greyfriars Churchyard, quite close to the High Court in Edinburgh, of course, and they broke into a tomb there and they uh, removed some of the remains from the tomb. And this wasn't just any old uh, tomb either. It was the family tomb of a 17th century Lord Advocate. So it was a bit of a a serious matter, but um, it went to trial. The two of them were were convicted at the end of the day and uh, they got a couple of years probation uh, rather than um, a one-way ticket to Australia, which I'm sure (laughs) they'd have preferred. But that that was certainly one of the most most memorable ones. I bet. And am I mixing it up with another case? Were they playing football with the skull or something like that? Yes, they were, Edith, but um, I I, I decided to leave that out out of good taste. (laughs) (laughs) Well, um, not like me to bring the tone down, but yeah, I do remember (laughs) reading that and I can't remember. Maybe maybe it was just a case at the time, but uh, I, I hadn't appreciated or hadn't remembered it was a former Lord Advocate, but... Goodness me. Yes, I think it was, it was a, well, there's a family tomb of a Lord Advocate called Bloody Mackenzie, mm. who I think had prosecuted Covenanters in, in, in the past. So it was quite a historic tomb, yeah. but um, that's a, a bit of a, um, a, grisly, a grisly tale. Yeah. So no. I, I don't, I'm not sure that um, we'll see one of them again soon, or I hope not. But um, <laughs> I, I remember that uh, 
as you know, for, for legal aid purposes, you have uh, the, the, the um, regulations which set out how much you get paid for each particular uh, crime, you know, whether it's murder and uh, what category it falls into. Yeah. And the Legal Aid Board had to amend their, uh, their, their, their tables to include violation of sepulchres uh, in it. So, um, <laughs> But I, I don't think it's been, been used since then. Yeah. Oh, no wonder that one sticks out, Richard. Yes. Yeah. Oh, goodness. Um, question nine is, who ha- who's had the biggest influence on your career at the bar? Sorry, well, in the law. In the law. Sorry. Uh, in the law. Um, well, I, again, I, I wouldn't. It's hard to, to pin it down to just uh, one single person. Um, mm. And uh, I did my training, um, criminal training, with um, George Moore in Edinburgh, and uh, he uh, was a, 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 a big influence on in a lot of criminal lawyers in Edinburgh, I think. And he was, uh, and I think you would admit, was a very demanding person uh, to work for. And but he had very high standards, and you had to be. Uh, prepared and he, he, he really taught you the, the value of preparation. Um, so there, there's George and the other person I think who was uh, good to me when I started working in, in the High Court was um, Morris Smythe, uh, a well-known Glasgow lawyer. And Morris was a very different character to George or is a very different character and much more easygoing. And albeit, you know, all of us work in this very, uh, the so-called adversarial system. Yeah. Um, I remember um, Morris saying in this very rich uh, mid-Atlantic draw that he's got of his, he said, Richard, uh, you catch a lot more bees with honey than you ever do with vinegar. Mm-hmm. And I remember him saying that. And what he meant, I think, is that more often than not, albeit it's an adversarial system, if you just are civil to people and pleasant to people within it, then you're more likely to, to get your way than you will if you go in fighting with people day in, day out. And I think that's very true. And I think, to be fair, uh, almost all of us, I think, get on pretty well on either side of the, the table um, uh, when, when we come to, to, to do the work we do, and probably a lot better than the public would expect us to. Um, yeah. We're not at war with each other all the time. No, that's very true. And I certainly subscribe to the school of better to get along with people. There's nothing worse. I would hate to think, and I hope that nobody does, but I'd hate to think as you're walking into court, people are thinking, oh no, here she comes or here uh, she comes. And, the eyes roll. You know, no, yeah. no, I, I think, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's doubtless, uh, no doubt times you have to stick to your guns and you have to be yeah. robust. But um, yeah, I mean, just um, a bit more uh, honey than vinegar, I'm, I'm sure works uh, works better most of the time. Yeah, definitely. That's, that, is, that is very true. Good advice. <clears throat> All right. Um, question number 10 is what was uh, the funniest or most memorable court moment for you? Well, uh, once again, th- th- this is a difficult one because th- th- there's so many incidents, aren't there? And, and just about every case you could come away with, with some story or other. And, and many of them, I suspect, we, we, uh, are, are unrepeatable at times. But um, and of course, this is the most funny or, or memorable and sometimes the most memorable moments aren't the most funny but um, I do remember um, not long after I started in Crown Office prosecuting a, a drugs case and uh, it involved uh, drugs coming up from Liverpool um, to uh, Fife and uh, this particular accused role was to sit in Liverpool with his mobile phone coordinating all these uh, couriers in, in Scotland and he was never caught with, with drugs. And because of that, I think he thought that he could just walk out of this trial. And I don't think he realised what the, the evidence was against him. And um, in actual fact, it was a very, very good case against him. And uh, however, he thought he knew best and he went in and he, he gave evidence and he thought he had an answer for absolutely everything, this guy. <laughs> and uh, of course, the, the, there's all these circumstances here and the net begins to close a, a bit. And um, asked him about, well, these phone calls that seem to appear on uh, outgoing from his phone just at the very time that drugs are getting handed over in all these different locations. And uh, he thought for a bit and he said, well, I didn't make those calls. And uh, I said, well, who who did then? And he said, "Uh, it was my dog. (laughs) And I said, well, yeah, the dog dog jumps up on me and it it, it just jumps up and it's pressed pressed, uh, call. And he thought this was the, the answer to it. But of course, there was a, a ream of text messages as well that were sent at the same time of an incriminating nature. 
And of course, the, the next question, of course, was, well, you, you, you could hear, of course, the, the jury just on your left hand side, you can feel the, the restlessness and the, the feet begin to shuffle and things and, 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 as, as he's making these explanations. And then, of course, uh, the text messages, he, he was asked, well, did, did the dog send the text messages? And uh, he, he realised, I think, the game was up and said, uh, well, no, my, my dog can't spell. <laughs> and of course, the, by this point, there's just uh, peals of laughter from, from oh. the, the jury, and, and that was the end of that. But um, <laughs> he, he got blasted by the, 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 the judge, I think, at, at sentence at the end of that. But So that, that was a, a funny moment, a memorable <laughs> moment, I think, Edith. Um, I, I remember seeing, uh, you know, really... Top operators, when I um, was an uh, instructing solicitor, guys like um, Derek Ogg and guys like Edgar Craze, uh, and I thought were just absolutely uh, fantastic operators with, with, with juries. And mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Edgar was, was, a, was a very amusing guy as well. Yeah. And uh, you know, I think watching these guys uh, do their, their job is, is something I'll, I'll, I'll not forget. Yeah, absolutely. And as you say, Richard, there's you, you probably, not that we're in it for the laughs, but in any given case, you probably could find something that um, is amusing or, you know, just entertaining. And, and it's just the nature of the job. Sometimes you think if you don't laugh, you'd yeah. cry the, the nature of some of the things that we have to deal with. But um, yeah, <laughs> that's mm -hmm. very good. <laughs> Usually clients kind of catch on a bit earlier than, than when they're giving evidence, but obviously he was well, a bit slow in the uptake. He was, and I, I think it, it was. Yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure he understood what the what the crown case was, and it, it just got worse and worse and worse. <laughs> oh, but at least the dog was spared the jail, though. For <laughs> That's right. <incrimination. laughs> He's incriminated. Um, oh dear. All right. Question eleven is: We all make mistakes. What have you learned from a professional error? Well, again, um, we, we don't like to admit them, really, do we? But I, um, I learned early on that conveyancing wasn't for me when I was um, a trainee. Um, I think that was about the first six months of my traineeship. And I'm, I'm not very good with uh, numbers and accounting and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> during uh, my traineeship, I remember um, one particular Friday, which is the day that all house purchases settle, I was told uh, to settle the sale of one house, settle the purchase of another house for the same client, and then split up the free proceeds from the sale of the house between the client and her ex-husband, deduct, uh, you see where this is going, don't you? <laughs> De <laughs> deduct fees, deduct outlays, uh, and uh, then uh, take the, 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 the remainder of the, the money that's left over, uh, get a cheque prepared for that, hand it over to the client. And of course, uh, this was um, a bit of a nightmare for, for me. And you can imagine uh, the, 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 my head was swirling. But I got it all done. Um, I got the cheque arranged, sent the cheque out. It was a Friday night. And that was that. And I went home happy. <laughs> and then about a week or two later, I began looking at the, uh, the, the computer accounts. And it, no matter how many times I looked at it, it just wasn't, wasn't working out. And... I realised I'd actually given her far too much money in this cheque. <laughs> and uh, it, it wasn't just a few pounds. Um, looking back now, I think it was roughly twice the amount of money that I was getting paid per annum as a trainee. Mm -hmm. So I had to then go and uh, admit my mistake to the, the partner who dealt with it well. And uh, we just um, managed to uh, get that, the money back from the client who was not too bad about it all. But um, mm -hmm. that um, made me learn that uh, that wasn't perhaps a field for me. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I saw you today, yeah. but yeah. Oh my goodness, you can feel. I could feel the fear of that as you were explaining. Yes. Yeah, yeah. and you, you think you've made a mistake yourself in, in the accounting, and it'll all work out. But um, no matter how long I looked at it, it just didn't. So <laughs> but we got there in the end. I learned from it. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh dear. Uh, question twelve, Richard, is what do you do to stay well? Um. Well, again, it's it's um, something which I suppose uh, is easier said than done. But if, if we can draw a line under work and uh, not carry it around with us uh, in the evenings if you're not working in the evenings or at the weekends if you're not working and go away and, and do something completely uh, different, then 
I, I try and do that. And I think it's, it's, it's healthy for all of us to, to have something or things that we, we, we really like doing outside of work because it's a, it's a great distraction when you're doing that. And it's, it's something that you can, I suppose, look to when you're, when you're in the midst of, of, of work and, and know that there's, there's an end to all of, the, all of this. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, well, I, I've, I've always loved um, sport, um, which is a, a great distraction. Uh, rugby, uh, cricket, um, some football, that sort of thing. And um, I'm going to be settling down later on this afternoon to watch Scotland play England at um, rugby, which um, whether that will be a worthwhile distraction from work, <laughs> time will tell. But, um, but th- that, that's a, a, always been a, a, a big thing uh, for me. Um, but outside of work, the main thing that I've loved all my life, um, strangely enough, uh, since I was about nine or ten, is fly fishing. Ooh. And um, I, I don't think I caught anything till I was about 13. So I, I'm not sure quite how I... I kept it up, but I did, and I'm, I'm glad I did. And uh, it's just been something which I've um, I've loved throughout my life. And um, I suppose when I was about, you know, in my teens or early twenties, it wasn't the most sort of fashionable thing to be into. I suppose when you're that sort of age, so um, it, it wasn't something that sort of uh, that you would uh, necessarily broadcast about, you know. But I've reached an age now where it's acceptable, and I can tell people about it. But um, <laughs> I, I love it, and um, it takes you outdoors. There's often a lot of walking involved. Um, some beautiful places and um, it's, uh, for me uh, the day just goes by in blink of an eye and uh-huh. that uh, must be a, a, an indicator of, of, of how much I'm enjoying myself. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that. Oh that's lovely and um, has your, ca- your ability to catch fish, has that improved? It has a, has a wee bit Edith, yeah. <laughs> I, I've, uh, I've, I've caught a, a few since then. Um, I, I, I do a lot of trout fishing. I started salmon fishing a few years ago. That's a bit more difficult, and there, there, there are a bit less of them around. Um, but um, I, I suppose uh, if you're if you're not a, a top fisherman like I am, or not I am not a top fisherman. If you're <laughs> if you're like me, then it's, it's, you'd say it's not all about catching fish. It's no. about just getting out there and things like Absolutely. that. So, and um, I know nothing about fishing. I, there's a river just where I live, and quite often. If I'm out with the dog, I'll, I'll suddenly come up on a man in the river up to his belly in, in the freezing water. I was thinking, good grief. And he's just standing there for hours. Is, is, is that fly fishing? Do you need to get in the water? Yes, yeah, that, that, that will be, yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. Um, so uh, I know the river you're talking about, actually, because I think I, I did a, a, a trial and I think there was um, mm. a, a murder along there, there I think, at one time. So way, way far away from where I am. <laughs> but <it's laughs> you would say that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> A few miles along, but yeah, the grave, um, that's yes. where it was. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't, that's part of the fun, is it? Standing. Well, it's, it's not, not, the, not, not fun, so standing in cold water, is it? But um, <laughs> it's a, I think uh, when, when, you're, when you're there and, and you're, uh, you're, you're, you're fishing, there's an awful lot of things going that, that you're trying to do at, at once, a big distraction, and you tend not to, 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 to notice these sorts of things, I suppose, the discomfort of it all. Yeah. Um, I, I can come back with, um, and I've not eaten my lunch because I've, I've just been too busy, and uh, uh-huh. which sounds like a strange thing to, 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 to say because you're, you're just absorbed with do, doing other things. And um, I've been on one or two trips, of course, with um, colleagues of yours who are, are big fishermen. I can uh, imagine like, who. <laughs> Lennon and, and others, yeah. so um, we have good fun. Yeah, but as you say, it's the... It's the complete immersion in something that you enjoy um, that takes you away from thinking about cases. And it's also quite a good way to reset, isn't it? Like if you've got a jury speech or something to write, probably better off going and doing some fishing uh, and then coming back to it the next day if you, if you can to, to then really be able to think clearly about it. I th- definitely. I mean, um, I, I think uh, the outdoors is, is fantastic. And I think in, in recent months, I suspect all of us, um, because we've not been able to, to meet up um, or exercise or um, socialize in the way that we, we have uh, in the past. Uh, certainly amongst the groups of friends I have, um, walking and out- outdoors hill walking and things have become really pretty popular these days. Yeah. And um, so, you know, maybe, maybe this will carry on when we, when we get out of this, this place we're in just now. Absolutely, I know. All right, um, question number 13 is, what advice would you give on dealing with challenging clients? Well, um, I- in Crown Office, don't have a client, of course, but um, I, I did um, many years in, in, in defence work, and uh, my advice would be uh, just to be upfront with with difficult clients. 
because you know, at times you have to deliver um, news that a client's not going to like, and that might be that their appeal has failed. It might be that you know a very damaging piece of evidence has, has, has emerged. It might be that the sentence they're likely to get uh, is going to be one that they uh, fear or, or whatever. And I think if that's the case, you have to be frank with, with, with clients about that. I'm not saying be brutal about it, but you have to be, to be honest about it uh, because there's no point in telling people things that they, they want to hear. And sometimes you get clients, uh, and some of them are very good at trying to get you to say what they want to hear. Yeah. And you have to resist that. It's the easiest thing in the world to, in the short term to do that. But in the long run, all you're doing is heaping pressure onto yourself um, and giving a client false expectations. And if you're frank and upfront, then you're going to end up being right at the end of the day. And you're going to end up at the end of the day, uh, getting a reputation as somebody who's going to be telling uh, clients the, the good, honest advice. So I would just say, be upfront um, and be courageous about that without necessarily being brutal about it. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's, that is very good advice. Um, Question 14 is, would you recommend law as a career? Um, yes, I, I would. Um, I, I think a law degree uh, opens up the door to a, a huge, sort of diverse range of, 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 of jobs and careers, um, both here and, and, and abroad. And certainly when I left university, there was an expectation that you would do a diploma, do a traineeship and qualify as a solicitor and it would go on from there. I think it's a different now. I think people um, do law degrees and don't necessarily practice uh, law or, or don't necessarily practice in, in the field as, a, as, as solicitors. Um, but I think uh, you, you're opening the door to, to, to a, a huge range of, of, of work. I mean, the, the work you and I do in the criminal courts are very far removed from somebody who works, for example, in a commercial practice or whatever. Um, would I recommend working in the criminal courts? Well, Again, I, I, I would. It's not for everybody. Um, it's not nine to five um, and put your pen down on a, on a Friday and pick it up on the Monday morning. It, it, it's, it, there's a huge commitment there and it involves a lot of highs and a, a lot of lows too. But it's an interesting job. It's, excuse me, satisfying. And without being too, too pious about it all, I, I do think that you do get a sense, I think, that you, ha you have contributed to the good whether on the defence side or, or the prosecution side, that you're doing a, a, a job which is, is, is worthwhile. So um, a huge variety of, of, of different spheres you can go into. And, um, you know, I'm sure that there's, there's, there's a sphere in there for, for everybody. Convincing wasn't for me, but um, hopefully I've found something that suits me a wee bit more. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank you, Richard, for that. Um, Question 15 is, what aspects of your job bring you the most satisfaction? Well, when I thought about this, um, I, I've sometimes wondered to myself that, you know, you, you sometimes finish a case and you've, you've got the result that, that you wanted to get, but you, you, you go away knowing in your own head, if, you, if you're honest uh, in appraising yourself, you think, well, there's parts of that, that I could have done better, but... It's, 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 it's turned out okay. Mm -hmm. There's that. That's number. That's the first situation. But the alternative are, is, of course, that there are some cases that you do when you think I've I've done that case as, as well as I possibly could have. I, I, could, I couldn't done any better, but you didn't get the result you were looking for. And sometimes you, you wonder in your mind whether what's best. You know, uh, the first or the second. And I think the the second one has to be the one which I think gives you the most satisfaction. In other words doing the the case to, to the best of your abilities um, and I remember somebody saying and I think it's true that you know both sides can't win you, you, you can't win all, all, all the time and all you can do is just control how you perform and if you do that as well as you think you could have then uh, that's uh, satisfying and I think if you're doing prosecution work that, that that's that's particularly important to remember because of course it's not all about winning. It's not all about getting a, a conviction. It's about just um, fairly bringing out all the evidence in uh, an, as effective a, a way as you possibly can and then pressing that 
as legitimately as, 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 as far as you can uh, in, in a legitimate and fair way. So if you can do that and you've, you've, you've done it um, in, in a way that you look back honestly and say, well, I couldn't have done that any better, then that's satisfying. So in a long-winded way, what I'm saying, it's, it's not all about the result. I think it's about if you look back honestly and say, I, 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 I did that well, then that, that's satisfying. Yeah, absolutely. Because you, you really just start working with whatever you have, but as long as you're putting into it as much as you can, then that's... Um, Yes, absolutely. And, you know, there are times, uh, you, you'll you know better than me, but there are times, I'm sure, on the defence side when you're working with very, very little and uh, mm. you've, you've hardly anything to work with. And, uh, you, you know, I've seen uh, plenty of council make um, a, a fantastic job out of very little indeed, and uh, which I'm sure must be a, a very satisfying experience. Yeah, no, absolutely. All right, question number 16 is, what skill should every lawyer have or learn? Um, well, what, what, what's, the, the word I think uh, is, is empathy, and that, that's not a legal skill at all. It's, it's, it's maybe just something you, you, you maybe just have to learn. And so I, I think just having a, an understanding or an insight uh, of, about how other people um, are, are feeling or might react to things um, because our job involves dealing with people, whether that's a client, whether that's a witness, whether that's a, a jury. And if you can have some sort of degree of understanding as to how that person is going to uh, react uh, uh, to a particular uh, piece of, of, of evidence, for example, if it's a jury, is that should you lead that evidence or not? Or are a jury going to be well disposed towards that or will they not? Uh, if I uh, question this witness in this particular way, what am I going to realistically get out of them? So I think it's just having an understanding of, of, of human nature um, and, and an empathy towards uh, other people, I think is a, a, a great attribute um, in uh, dealing with uh, all, all areas of, of, of court work, um, down to uh, juries, witnesses, and even how you're going to pitch a plea and mitigation to a judge. Yeah. Um, you know, where, where, what are you going to what, what are you going to say here? What are you going to ask the judge to do? Um, and uh, you, to, to a degree, I think having an understanding of how things are going to be received by other people is a, a great quality. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Mm. All right, question seventeen, Richard, is your favourite chocolate bar? Um, I'm going to go, Edith, for a picnic on the basis that it's got nuts and raisins in it there and you can, you can sort of convince yourself that it's not all completely bad for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting choice. Okay. Um, question 18. What job would you be terrible at? Well, um, I've already uh, admitted you know my uh, inability with numbers and things so anything involving uh, numbers uh, we, we, I would have to leave to the side um, also I think any uh, job that involves uh, working from heights would not be a, a good job for, for me and um, when I was thinking about that again I, I, I remember this uh, situation where I've talked about uh, fishing and going fishing with, with uh, uh, Tony Lenehan and uh, a year or two ago, he invited me to go fishing with him. Uh, he had some fishing up um, in, in Perthshire. And so I agreed to meet him uh, in the car park at the a roundabout at Perth. And he would drive on from there. So we did that. And I was putting my stuff in the back of, of his car. And I couldn't help but notice there was um, ropes, uh, helmets, all this harnesses and things like this. And I said to him, I, I thought we were going fishing. And he said, well, you'll see when you get there, sort of thing. <laughs> so we arrived at this place and um, Tony tied a, a, a rope ladder onto a tree and then disappeared with his helmet on over the side of a cliff. And, you know, I do mean a cliff. You know, this was just like something out of you know, the Roadrunner or something like that. And um, down he went. And after about 10 minutes, he then shouted to me, you can come down now. And, uh, of course, I, had to, <laughs> I went on my hands and knees towards the edge of this cliff. <laughs> and got onto this rope ladder and um, down I went. And my only comfort was that, that, that I kept telling myself that if this ladder is strong enough to take Tony, it's strong enough <laughs> to take me. And my, my foot eventually touched something solid and, and uh, I daren't look down. And he said, that's you got your foot on the second ladder now. So there was still a good way to go. 
But we got down there and um, it was worth it in the end just because it was a, a really sort of, it was like the land that time forgot when we got down there and mm. uh, this gorge, um, rivers full of salmon and we had a great day out. But um, only, the only downside was that I knew I had to cr- climb back out of this place <laughs> again. But, um, so yeah, anything involving heights uh, is, oh is not for me. Yeah, I've heard of a number of victims of Tony's uh, and I was just going to ask, you, you answered the question, but I just wondered whether he had simply taken that route just because he could or there was another route to this place, but no, you had to go down the, the rope ladder, did you? To, he did. To... Well, I, I did say to him, is this all completely necessary? And he said, well, the only other way of getting in is on a canoe when the, when the river's at a certain height. So it was, <laughs> it was one thing or the other, wasn't it? You know? <laughs> He's actually just to be a guest on this quiz, although I do get the distinct feeling he's avoiding me. So um, I'll need to tell him that he's, he'll need to come and defend himself against these uh, stories about taking folk off cliffs, but I'm sure he'll <laughs> completely accept it. But um, yeah, sounds like, I was going to say fun. It doesn't sound like fun at all, but um, I know that Tony mm-hmm. finds these sort of things fun. He does, he does. Oh dear. Funny how he didn't mention that when uh, he was making the arrangements to go fishing, though, eh? No, no. <laughs> If we'd have gone somewhere else, I think, uh, somewhere a bit closer to home. Maybe that river down the road from you or something, you did. Exactly. Oh, dear. Um, okay. Uh, question 19. Richard is your favourite animal and uh, it comes with the condition that if you have a pet, it should make an appearance on the video. Well, um, I can answer some of it, but I might not be able to, uh, to, to, to make the appearance part. But when I was a wee boy, we always had um, dogs, so it's Springer Spaniels. And, uh, you know, I've, I've always loved dogs and I'd love to have a dog. But I'm afraid just the, the, the sort of working practices uh, we have or working hours we have um, means that we'd be a bit impractical and things. So a year or two ago, though, we got a kitten. So we have a, a, a cat, a um, very affectionate cat, and uh, who, with his home working, j- will just come and l- lounge over the laptop at times and uh, make life difficult. But um, the, the cat's around here somewhere, but uh, as you know with cats, they will not come if I, if I uh, call for him or anything like that. So oh. I'll just have to say a cat and um, leave it at that, I'm afraid, rather than uh, putting an appearance in. <laughs> you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're a bit difficult to to to, to round up. Absolutely, they're yeah, very much uh, independent animals, aren't they? Like to do the uh, yeah, yeah. But I, I, I do like dogs. I know you've got one as well, haven't you? I a do. Dog. She's she is. Hang on, we'll see if I can get her. She's in her bed, but she's close by. Hang on. Here she is. This is Mabel. Oh, so, look at her. Yeah, I know. She People quite often ask why is she wearing a jumper, but and it's not that it's freezing in here, but she does feel the cold, so... Um, and I, I imagine she's got quite a, a large wardrobe as well, does she? <laughs> she does. These uh, things, I think I'm boring her. She just, uh, she just yawned at me there. <laughs> <laughs> These little jumpers are actually... Um, you wouldn't believe on online... Uh, you buy them online, they're called Echo Fleeces, but at the moment they are completely out of stock, so... There's actually a Facebook page where people are buying and selling secondhand ones. So this, I could probably get quite a profit out of this scabby old thing. Um, but yeah, dash hounds are quite, well, smooth here dash hounds have got quite thin coats. So um, yeah, she, she shivers in the summer. So oh, yeah. she, that, that's definitely her colour, Edith. I think it's very, think? Tasteful. <laughs> very tasteful. Right, you can go back to your bed, miss. Um, Thing. Thanks for disturbing me. Um, so we've come then to our last question, Richard, which is yes. what question should we have included in the quiz? Um, I, I think that the, the question uh, I've picked is what's the single best piece of advice you've been given in connection with court work? Mm. And my answer to that would be um, before you say anything in court, write it down first. Right. And I know that's that's not going to be possible all the time, mm-hmm. but um, I think when it comes to things like um, legal submissions, uh, when it comes to planning cross examination or exa- leading a witness examination in chief, and particularly when it comes to, to jury speeches, then I, I always try and uh, commit things to, to paper, uh, typed out or, or, or written down first, because that gives you a, a far greater 
um, structure um, it gives you um, makes things probably clearer and uh, probably briefer as well. Mm -hmm. And above anything else, it it just gives you a, a great uh, comfort uh, when you go into court to know that. I've got this um, thing in a folder that I can always rely on if, uh, if, if things go wrong. I mean, we've seen, or I've certainly seen uh, counsel doing jury speeches without a, a, a single scrap of paper. And, you know, Ian Dugood, who yeah. I know was one of your guests before, does that. I mean, it's, and it's, uh, it's incredible to, to, to watch. Um, but uh, that, that, that suits him. And uh, it, it's, it's, it suits me very well. But I, I think it's a risky game to play to try and copy that. Um, and um, <laughs> I think it can go t terribly wrong for some people. But no, I, I always think that just to have something committed to paper down in front of you, if you're walking through the door of a court knowing that in your bag you've got a, a folder with everything you need in black and white on it, then uh, the, the rest of the day goes uh, far more smoothly and uh, you, know, you can be far more relaxed. Yeah, that is... Very good advice, and that's definitely why I do. Even if it is, even if you don't, it's just even if you don't refer to it, it's there. Plus, I think the actual practice of writing or typing something out gives you a structure and gives you a start starting point, which is usually the, the most difficult part too. And yes. your feet, isn't it? Well, I think there's people sometimes I think are slow to admit that they do this, and because I think some people like to think, well, I just uh, do it off the off the cuff, and you know I, I, that, that that's that's the way I operate. But mm -hmm. so I, I think people sometimes prefer. Uh, to, 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 to suggest that they don't do it. But I think it's a, 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 a really crucial uh, way of, of, of going about things. I know that some judges and training they've delivered certainly uh, suggest that's the, the, the way to go too. And that I, I remember reading a, a, a judgment from the appeal court to saying that, you know, if people, people do jury speeches, um, if it's not written down or they don't have notes, then the likelihood of you uh, going off track and saying something you should never ever have said increases <laughs> enormously. So yeah. uh, it's a far less risky approach for us all, I think, to commit things to paper. Definitely, I know. Well, Richard, we have come to the end and you've been a fantastic guest. Thank you so much for your time and your answers. Um, they've been really interesting and I suppose showing a, another side of you that maybe people weren't aware of. So thank well, the, you. The, the fly fishing side. <laughs> <Not definitely. laughs> Um, yeah, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate it. And I'm sure lots of people will be tuning in to watch this once it's released. Well, thanks for the invitation, Edith. I've enjoyed it and um, hopefully see you soon. Yeah, I hope so, Richard. Take Good. care Bye and tonight. thanks again. All right. Bye-bye.